All right. So hi, everybody. It's so good to be here. It's so good to talk to you today. I'm going to be talking about Vanguard's commitment to client accessibility and what we do in terms of making sure that our content is inclusive and accessible. I'll talk about my work in the space and we'll talk about what we're learning um, and the next steps that we're taking. So a little about me. Um, my name is Oksana and I'm a senior UX researcher at Vanguard. And um, I work with Jess Kultler and Beth Fox, who are both alumni of UMD class of 2014. And they're in the skull, say hello guys. Um, they're listening in. Um, as Rachel mentioned, my background is in service design. Um, and I've been interested in accessibility for a very long time now, ever since my undergrad, and I started looking into accessibility of spaces. Um, and then that morphed into employment, um, accessibility for people with disabilities, um, and then into financial institution accessibility for people with disabilities. And I'm currently back at school for my second master's, and I'm developing a game that will teach people with cognitive disabilities how to manage money and invest. And that's something that I've been able to test with my panel at Vanguard, um, and uh, something that I feel very passionate about. So what's in this deck? Today, I'll give a brief introduction of accessibility, um, just some statistics that we already know, but just to ground us into what we'll be talking about today. We'll talk about why inclusion is important. I'll share my experience of working with a contractor with Down syndrome whom we hired to test our content um, to make sure that it was accessible and understanding. I'll talk about how I built an external panel of 60 individuals with various disabilities that I do um, research with. I'll share with you the internal panel of Vanguard clients that I have, a thousand clients that I can do statistically significant research with. So it's super exciting. I'm so stoked. Um, I'll talk about the social pathways matrix. It's a tool that we use in understanding how can we foster inclusion within Vanguard. And I'll share with you the steps that we've taken to go through the matrix exercise and the ideas that we came up with. I'll talk about what we're learning. So now that we're working with folks with disabilities, what have we learned? Uh, we'll talk about several projects that I've headed um, as a researcher, and I'll share with you main findings of what we've been learning from folks so far. And we'll cover next steps to talk about what this has this all led up to and what are we going to be doing next. So a little introduction. One in four US adults, that's 61 million um, Americans have a disability. And if we count the aging population, the number gets larger, uh, but these are the statistics from the CDC.gov. And they have $409 billion in annual disposable income, which uh, is quite a significant chunk of money. And we don't always design with their needs in mind. So that's something to keep in mind that there is um, money to be made in designing for people with disabilities because they are paying clients and they have money to spend. So um, I've had the privilege of interviewing an ethnographer who's blind, and we got to talking about people with disabilities and their experiences and the financial institution. And she said something very compelling to me. She said, as a society, we didn't think of people with disabilities as having money or managing their own money. And I thought, huh, that's, that's quite a statement to make. You know, that's, uh, that's an idea that really resonated with me. And I'm a researcher, have a curious mind. So I decided to run a little experiment. I have an Adobe Stock account. So I went onto Adobe Stock and I typed in person managing finances. And I've got a ton of results of icons, photography, placement photography, um, illustrations. And we see people in their homes managing money, looking at their laptops. Uh, a person sitting alone, possibly checking their bank account or talking to an advisor. We have somebody in the office setting doing some sort of financial stuff that they do in the office and all kinds of different things. And when I said to you, when I said the phrase person managing finances, we all had an image come up in mind that we had like a person doing something financially related. I thought, okay, that's great. So then I refined my search. And I said, person with disabilities managing finances. And only two results showed up 
neither one of them showing a person. So when I said president with disabilities managing finances, we all had a different idea of what that looked like. We maybe pictured the person, did we think about a person with Down syndrome who was checking their bank account to make sure that they have the funds to go out and eat with their friends? Do we think about a blind person investing in a market and possibly having to make a call to complete a trade because of accessibility concerns? Do we think about somebody who's deaf, who is starting to think about working with an advisor or buying their home? You know, we, we thought about different things, but um, as designers, we don't have the content to pull from even when we say person with disabilities managing finances. I just gave you a couple of examples of what we could have had an image of, but we didn't. We only had two images and both of them featured the accessible sign. So something to think about as we go through our design careers and we think about, and that's a problem because as designers, even if we don't have the content to draw from, then where are we going? So that got me into an interesting train of thought. So how can we foster inclusion for people with disabilities? Well, first of all, why is inclusion important? So this is my interpretation of inclusion and how it relates to accessibility. I work in the client experience and the client experience is the holistic overview of how an individual interacts with a service. So it goes beyond the digital stuff, the user experience, right? Beyond the screen of the user experience and we're thinking about all the touch points. So inclusion is to accessibility where client experiences to user experience. So inclusion is a holistic overview of how somebody is interacting with their finances. How do they learn about finances? Um, who do they who do they bank with? Who manages their finances and things like that? So the entire picture of somebody's financial health. And we know that people with disabilities are less likely to have a bank account, a credit card, or a credit score because uh, a lot of the times. Um, people, their family members often take care of the finances and take on the financial responsibility of the household. So that leads to us to understand that people with disabilities are often excluded from financial services. We do not design with their needs in mind. You know, I work as a senior UX researcher with a focus on accessibility and inclusion. And it's so rare to go into a meeting and say, hmm, I wonder how would somebody with a cognitive disability go about managing this flow that we've just designed? Or I wonder how would somebody who's blind interact with our um, in, you know, um, experience beyond the compliance of being compliant and ADA compliant. So going beyond that. Um, it's very rare to hear that in the meeting. So we don't design with our needs in mind. We design with able mind, able-bodied population in mind. And it's important to include people with disabilities because when we design with accessibility in mind, everybody benefits. Things like voiceover and voice um, control, um, things that text to speech, we all use it, uh, but it all started out as accessibility device. Um, iPhone just came up with a new upgrade where they can, um, you can point your screen to a door and it will tell you is a push or pull and how far away from the door are you? So if you're blind, you can, you know how to enter into a space. But I could see an instance where an able-bodied person might want to use that um, to understand as a push or pull, or you know, like where's the door if it's an interesting design of the building. Now, as researchers, there's a lot that we still don't know about how people with disabilities manage money. And moreover, there's a lot that we don't know about how to work with somebody with a disability. How do you hold the design thinking session with somebody who has Down syndrome, for example? Or how do you conduct uh, research with somebody who's blind? How do you recruit for people with disabilities? So in my work at Vanguard, I strive to answer these questions. So Vanguard um, has made a significant commitment to inclusion and accessibility especially within the last two years within the division that I work in, the client experience division. So we have an office of accessibility and we've had it since I believe 2016. And what they do is they assess all of our products before they go to market 
to make sure because we build websites and mobile apps. So they assess those experiences to make sure that they're ADA compliant and we get compliant. So the guidelines that they're compliant. But we didn't have anything that said, okay, but is it usable for somebody with a disability? So we now have an office of accessibility. Um, and then what the external panel of inclusion, the third party, we have a third party talent agency in Australia that helps people with autism get jobs at Vanguard and we've hired people into various roles at Vanguard with autism. And we have an external panel of 60 individuals with disabilities. Um, who do not have a Vanguard account. Some of them do invest, some of them do not invest, but they're not Vanguard clients. Um, and they help us understand, is it usable? Okay, it's compliant, but is it usable for somebody with a disability? And we have an internal panel of a thousand Vanguard clients who identify as having a disability or caring for somebody with a disability that we do research with. And finally, we hired a contractor with Down syndrome to help us assess our digital experiences and our workflows. So before we go any further, I just want to kind of ground this a little bit. Vanguard as an organization. So Vanguard is a financial institution. It's all, you know, all about investing the stock market. And as an organization, it consists of four major divisions. There's participant investors like 401k. Some of you might have a 401k, um, something you get with your employer. There is institutional investors, which is advisors of different institutions working with other people who are investing. There is international investors. And then there's retail investors, people who have brokerage accounts, IRAs, trusts, um, on any kinds of things like that. So some of you might have a brokerage account and you might be investing or you might be investing, maybe you're not investing with Vanguard, but maybe you're investing with Robinhood or with Fidelity or other you know, brokerage firms. So my work is focused in retail investors. So people who sit down and say, I want to invest in the stock market and I want to open up an account, either a retirement account, an IRA, or a regular brokerage account where I'm going to be trading stocks on the market. So that's what I look at and that's what I research for as well. So contractor with Down syndrome, I would I love sharing this story. We hired uh, a young woman with Down syndrome. I'll call her Susan. Um, it's not her real name, but for anonymity, we'll, we'll say it's Susan. So Susan um, went to college. She reads at a 12th graders level. Um, and she's been a part of our uh, panel when we first built it for a long time. And then she became a contractor for Vanguard. And the reason we hired her is because I was doing research with folks with Down syndrome to test our content. Um, and I found that they were doing an incredibly um, great job of testing out the content for readability, usability, and clarity. And I was limited in how much research I could do with our panel. So in the research world, we have incentives, right? We have to incentivize our research. And so I was limited of only doing three sessions every couple of months because um, a research participant cannot earn more than $600 from Vanguard in incentives. Otherwise it's considered income and they have to file taxes for it. So we had to make sure that all of the research incentives were under $600, which meant that I can only do a handful of sessions um, every couple of months. But the more I started doing this work, the more content started coming in. And I started expanding my relationships within Vanguard and working with more content strategists. And I realized that there's a ton of content out there and I just don't have the capacity to test it doing it a handful of times every couple of months. So um, I went to my manager and I said, I'd love to hire somebody part-time with Down syndrome who would read our content and I would work with that person. Um, and I was very lucky that fund management said, that's a great idea, we'll do it. Um, and so we did it. Um, and uh, Susan was uh, testing our content for a very long time. She's worked with us for uh, five months and she's touched on all of the divisions of Vanguard and all of their content. She's touched on international, institutional, retail, um, and um participant content and has been able to identify what problems she had with content or what uh, what she would what she found easy to understand. 
So the way I worked with Susan was I did co-generative interview sessions where we would sit down, she would read the content, and then she would tell me, this is what I'm reading, this is what I'm understanding, and I will be able to ask questions as we go along the way. Then we do quizzes. I would do follow-up quizzes to these things that she was reading to see if it was uh, resonating with her. But she had very high social desirability. So she was like, oh, if I get an answer wrong, that's bad. And I want to do a good job. So, you know, we said, okay, let's not do quizzes. That's too much pressure. So I started doing follow-up papers where I would say, let's talk about what you've just read and how it relates to people with disabilities. And she would write very thoughtful content, but she would write about hiring people with disabilities and her experience as a person working with Down syndrome for Vanguard. So she wasn't able to uh, kind of talk about her experience externally and say, this is how a person with Down syndrome thinks about things, but she was able to say, this is what I understand and this is what I don't understand. So things like acronyms and terms like hypothetical income, which by the way, I didn't know about you, but I didn't know what hypothetical income means in terms of financial institutions and how it relates to your finances. So I'm not surprised that Susan had problems with it. So Susan was instrumental for us to understand what terms are we using, kind of nil-willy, thinking that people know it, but uh, they're not really layman's terms and we're not explaining the content in a way that is accessible and easy to understand. And so, and as a researcher, I, a lot of the times I hear people say, you know, you have to be savvy to navigate the Vanguard website. So things like that was something that Susan helped us um, really understand and um, uncover. So how I built an external panel of participants with disabilities. So I was always interested in accessibility and inclusion. And before I was with Vanguard, I was working in e-commerce. So I was working for urban outfitters and QVC. And uh, during my time at both QVC and urban outfitters, I became very interested in accessibility and adoptive clothing and how people with disabilities shop for things. So I thought, why don't we have people with disabilities testing our content and see if they could shop for things? So when I came to Vanguard, I already had that idea in mind of, oh, I wonder how somebody with a disability navigates our experience. And then I switched gears into working into a financial institution and I've connected with accessibility office. And so I said, okay, so we're compliant, but we don't know if somebody with a screen reader can actually go through this experience and navigate it in a pleasant way, in a usable way. We don't know if the experience is usable. We only know that it's compliant. So this started as a conversation between me and one of my mentors. And I said, wouldn't it be great if we had a person who's blind, colorblind, has low vision, has Down syndrome, and we assess our experiences with them on daily basis or on, on regular cadence, to assess it for usability. They were like, yeah, that, that would be great. So they said, why don't you go to accessibility office and see what they think about that idea? So I went to the accessibility office and they said, yeah, that's a great idea. We've always wanted to do something like that. So they said, why don't you expand it to five people of each ability and test it that way? So you have a statistically significant sample in qualitative research. I said, great. So they were like, yeah, okay, so if you can pull it off, do it. So uh, I went to my managers and I said, can I try to do this? And they said, yeah, go ahead, try and do this. And I think we were all thinking like, oh, can we actually do it? So I started reaching out to local companies um, and built a panel of people with disabilities. So I teamed up with local organizations like Chester County Down Syndrome Interest Group, uh, Penn Medicine. I've teamed up with um, other different support groups for people with disabilities. I would reach out to them on Facebook and on community boards and even post on job board that I'm looking for people with disabilities. And, you know, I'm looking to compensate you for the feedback that you give me on a financial institution. So would you be willing to join my panel? And I was able to build uh, a panel of 25 individuals with disabilities 
and test my content with them. So this was all still going on as kind of like a side project that I was doing on top of my regular work as a researcher. So then um, I was able to shift my focus into my accessibility work, and I was able to provide value with it. And I was able to uh, define my role as having a focus in accessibility and inclusion. And then we increased our budget, and we teamed up with a third-party provider named Nobility to recruit more people with disabilities, to also include people who are deaf, have autism, and have motor impairments. So now we have a panel of 60 individuals consisting of various disabilities, which is very exciting. And we do research with them. So we do things like understanding how would somebody who's deaf interact with the chat feature? What are they looking for in the conversational channel? Um, what is ableist language? Do people with disabilities find terms like see, click here, fast? Are these ableist or pseudo ableist terms, and I'll get back, get into it later on in my presentation, what we found out, but these are the questions that we were able to answer. So now I'm able to guide conversations like, how do we make sure that we write inclusive content? And how do we make sure that we, pro we provide all channels of um, interaction for people with different disabilities and abilities and make sure that we're designed with everybody in mind? So I pulled out a couple of, um, quotes from um, the people in my um, panel of why it's important to invest. So here's one, investing is important for growth, for long-term value. You can just put your money under your mattress and it will be there or you can try to grow it and turn it into more. Being blind and investor means you have independence. It means you're like everyone else. It's nobody's business what's in your wallet or in your bank account. Just because I'm blind doesn't mean I have to rely on someone to tell me how much money I have. I should be able to know this by myself. I love this quote. It came from a participant who's blind on my panel, whose own two businesses sold them, lived um, out in the wilderness on her own just to see if she could do it. She's incredibly independent and she's an investor. And she's very passionate about money management. Having a disability doesn't mean that you're unable to succeed. It means that you have the strength to use other abilities to do so. This came from a participant who is um, also blind and is a developer and learned how to code by having his wife read the books and tell him what she's just read. And he was able to become a developer and learn how to code. And he just got a huge promotion and moved on from being a partner of our uh, panel. But we wish him all the best. It was such a pleasure working with him. And another complaint quote, our money might not look the same color to me as it does to you. But as far as I know, it still buys the same amount of bread. So that's somebody who's colorblind. We have a lot of um, data visualization in financial services that is, that is going on. So charts, graphs, things like that, making sure that they're accessible for people who can differentiate between colors. We then said, okay, but I always got this question of, well, how many people at Vanguard have a disability, right? Or how many of our clients have Down syndrome or something like that? So I was looking for ways to survey our client population to see how many people have a disability that we interact with. And what happened was that we have an internal panel of Vanguard clients who opted into market research. And there's 5,000 of them. These folks participate in research for points and they can exchange those points for Starbucks gift cards or rewards and things like that. And uh, we do research with them. That's our internal panel, we call it MREC. So I did a survey with them and I said, how many people on the panel have a disability? Um, and I found a thousand clients who said that they either have a disability or care for somebody with a disability. And something to note here. So when I was doing this research, I couldn't just come out and ask the panel, do you have a disability, a cognitive disability or a physical disability? Yes or no. Um, I went to our legal department and they said, that's personal information. We can't ask that. So I said, okay, I wonder how can I get to it? And they said, well, you can ask a question about the experience of using the computer, 
but you can't actually say, do you have a disability? So I started putting together questions like, when you read content, do you find it difficult to understand the words that you're reading or to understand the meaning of words that you're reading? Do you use assistive technology to access the web? Have you opened a special needs trust for somebody? And I was also able to say, are you a caretaker? And that was something I was able to ask. So that's how I arrived at a thousand clients saying yes. And then I did a lot of lab work and going through those responses and separating them into cognitive, possible cognitive disability, possible physical disability and a caretaker. And so we're doing further research with them. Why is this important? So this now provides a statistically significant sample size for me to do quantitative research with folks with disabilities. Um, and it also proves that there's a huge population of Bangor clients who have a disability or care for somebody with a disability. So now I can point and say, well, if MROG is a representation of our population, one fifth of those folks have a disability or are a caretaker. So we can assume that we have a healthy amount of people who invest with Vanguard who have a disability. I'm now able to marry qualitative and quantitative research methods with folks with disabilities. So with my panel of 60 individuals, I do a lot of qualitative research where I um, do Luma exercises with them. So design thinking exercises. I do lots of interviews surveys, things like that. But to do a statistically significant survey, I now have a thousand people with disability that I can pull research from. So I can now marry uh, different methods together. And more importantly, it now allows for faster research and project scope. So it proves that focusing on accessibility can be rewarding in the product development, and it doesn't have to slow things down. There's a stigma out there that if you design accessible experiences, it's going to slow down your sprint, it's going to slow down the speed of work that you're doing it with. And I'm proving that that is not the case. You can do fast research and still make sure that it's accessible and inclusive. So here's an example of how we solve for inclusion of Vanguard using the social pathways matrix. I love bringing in different tools into the work that I do um, and I love going through and kind of introducing different things that I'm working on um, and new tools. So this is a social pathways matrix. Um, it consists of around nine squares and you have project system culture, individual interdisciplinary cross sector. So you would say as an individual, what is one project you can do to solve the question? As an interdisciplinary team of designers, what can you do to solve, what project can you work on to work on, on this question and so on and so forth. And then culture is culturally, what can we do and how can we expand? So we said, our question is going to be, how can we solve our financial inclusion for people with disabilities? So we had a multidisciplinary team um, to approach this topic. We had content strategists, developers, a researcher, um, and a designer. And we use the, the matrix to propose solutions to, that were feasible for us to do. So we said, as the designer, I can do this. As a team of people, we can do this. And we operated under the idea that people with disabilities are more likely to have their relatives take care of their finances, that they're more likely to have no credit history, and they're less likely to trust the financial institution. So they're more likely to encounter barriers to entry, both physically and digitally. So we co-generated ideas on each square and talked about each idea on the sticky note before we committed to it. And this is the matrix that we came up with. So individual interdisciplinary cross sector. So a project, as a designer, uh, a designer can design a disability friendly teller here sign for banks to who are trained to work with people with disabilities and to present their information. A team of designers and professionals can create a box of financial knowledge for people with disabilities to down, download and use. So that could be something on Vanguard.com. When you go to our website, you could have a box of financial knowledge that you can download and it would say, if you have a disability, here are some things you should keep in mind. For example, 
if you are uh, on social, if you receive social support, social, secu social security um, benefits, then you cannot have more than $2,000 to your name. Otherwise, if your income becomes larger than that, then you are losing your benefits. So a lot of people with disabilities are afraid to invest because they're afraid to grow their money to beyond that um, number. So they're scared to do that. And um, as a, a cross-sector, we could work with city officials to approve the box of financial knowledge to bring it to um, the general public. As culture, we could have Tim Buckley, our CEO of Vanguard, announce a special program for financial inclusion for people with disabilities or caretakers. Uh, we could work with banks to make sure that they hire uh, to specifically increase the enrollment of people with disabilities within their um, population and make sure that the training their tellers to work with different people with different disabilities. Um, we can have an uh, interdisciplinary system. We can have a teacher team up with a financial planner to create financial education curriculum in multiple levels, high school, special education, college, designed specifically for people with disabilities. Um, that's where kind of my game sits um, and generates ideas. So what are we learning from people with disabilities? Ableist language. So our content strategists came to me and said, you know, Oksana, I wonder if what we're writing is ableist. I don't know if it's ableist. Um, I, they've done the research and there's a lot of research out there talking about um, how to work with people with disabilities, but don't have a lot of understanding of what people with disabilities consider to be ableist. So we said, okay, we can do research around that. And I was, and I thought, I'm curious about that myself. For example, I have a close friend who's blind and to navigate our world around, he holds on to my elbow and then we walk to different places across the street and things like that. And if there is something on the street where he needs or a curb, I say, hey Nick, what's your stuff? And then I'll ask him, was that ableist for me to say, watch your step? And he'll say, no, I don't think so. I don't consider it to be ableist. But these were the kind of questions that the team was saying, I wonder if we're using ableist language when we're writing our copy. So what we found is that people with disabilities experience ableist language on a daily basis, like doctors' offices, retail stores, online retailers, um, we weren't able to get a good idea of which retailer does a particularly good job of addressing people with disabilities. The answers vary, but people said American Express had a great chat experience for people who are deaf. Um, Amazon and Target came up as things that were pleasant to shop for, for different clothing stores and things like that. Um, and um, it all came down to what are the workers doing? How are they addressing you? How are they addressing you by your first name? Uh, we had an individual talk about an experience he had at the bookstore and how a teller was uh, really attentive to his needs. And people with disabilities want to be addressed just like everybody else with respect and dignity. At the end of the day, that's what it comes down to. So if you're not sure how to address them, simply ask and say, hey, how can I help you? What's the best way for me to help you? Since, you know, if, if you're blind, what's the best way for me to help you find the item you're looking for? And we also had them assess Vanguard.com for English language. And luckily for us, uh, the participants did not find English language on Vanguard.com. We asked them, do you consider words like click, like click this button, see, see this page for more detail. Here, visit the page to hear what Tim Buckley thinks about XYZ. Speak, speak with an advisor, or easy and fast. Take this quick questionnaire. It's easy to buy an ETF. So we said, do you consider these terms to be ableist or pseudo-ableist? And we had 24 people take a look and tell us what they thought was ableist and what they thought was not ableist. So. An important thing to note here is that we didn't reach a majority 
conclusion here. So 40% of people said none of the above was ableist, but 40% of people thought that, um, you know, the rest of the percent of people thought that these terms were ableist. So 41% of people thought that click was an ableist term um, and C was an ableist term and things like that. Here's some quotes from ableist language. Most of my experience with ableist language involves people who choose to communicate with someone who may be at the establishment with me, or they may automatically make the assumption that because I am blind, I cannot perform a task without sight and help. Retailers should always be trained to speak directly to an individual and ask if there is anything they can do to help with whatever service it is they offer. Whenever I encounter language, oh, I'm sorry. My dog walker is here, so my my little floof pepper is going crazy. Whenever I encounter language such as drag or drop this box, click here or view for more information, hover the mouse or highlighted section, I feel that a lot of businesses are completely unaware that there are many people who do not use a mouse to access their computers and that there's something called assistive technology that enables people with disabilities to use a computer as well. We did a study on deaf individuals and chat features. So our conversational channels team, it's a team that works on chat, voice, IVR. So they came to me and they said, hey, I wonder how would somebody who's deaf interact with the chat experience? And they said, we want to design with folks who are deaf in mind, but we don't even know how does somebody who's deaf interact with a chat experience. So. I said, okay, it sounds like we need to do some discovery research to understand how will people who are deaf interact with this feature. So deaf investors prefer live chat or text messages to communicate with their service provider. Uh, they can talk on the phone, but it requires a video for a deaf investor to get connected with an interpreter. So talking on the phone, calling a service, it's an extremely cumbersome a task for somebody who's deaf because they have to be make sure that they're video ready so they're dressed um they have to constantly attend to the call they can't multitask like a hearing person can cook do laundry fall clothes somebody who's deaf cannot do that they're on the phone they're constantly watching the interpreter to interpret back to them what the person is saying they didn't like going through the ivr because it's annoying it sends them in circles they often choose um, IVR is when you call and it says press one for this option, press two for this option, that's IVR. Uh, and deaf investors don't like the IVR service because um, it talks too fast sometimes for the interpreter to interpret all of the options. So they end up choosing their own option, that happens. And deaf investors feel like chatbots send them in circles and don't give them the answers that they're looking for. So they said, you know, I would look for something on the website for to help me because I feel like the chatbot is pulling from that. So there is no authenticity is what they feel like from a chatbot. So that's why they prefer a live chat with a lab agent or a text message or something like that. A hearing person can multitask when they're on the phone, but I cannot. I have to attend to the phone constantly. I have to put my life on hold to cater to your business. What a significant quote. I think just, I have to put my life on hold to cater to your business. That's something that resonates with me and my colleagues very deeply. So that's something that we're considering now that we're designing for our chatbot experiences. We also made sure that we are creating an empathetic content. So here, this was a very cool research that I did with a team called Change of Ownership. And Change of Ownership deals with when somebody passes away, a loved one passed away, and they have some money left with Vanguard, and now that money is going to be inherited by somebody else in the family. That's Change of Ownership. So it's really a death of a loved one, death of somebody, and you're inheriting money with Vanguard. You're inheriting Council Vanguard. So the team is dedicated to change of ownership um, and they create a lot of written content. So what was happening was that the service was phone only and you could call and get like help, but you didn't have a digital experience. 
and they didn't have anything that was explaining what happens during the inheritance process on the web, you had to call. So they started creating written content for people, for executors and beneficiaries. So a beneficiary is somebody that you're leaving money to, an executor is somebody who's going to be executing on the will. And they wanted to make sure that the content is empathetic and easy to understand because somebody going through a death of a loved one is in a very distraught state of mind. They may not have their cognitive reasoning all the way through. So it has to be simple language that we're breaking everything down as much as we can and make sure that it's empathetic because they're dealing with a death of a loved one. That's a significant event in their life. So I said, I think that's, and that's how the contractor with Down syndrome was born. I said, I think that's a great task for us to do with people with Down syndrome. We can write the, the copy for them. They can read it. And then they can tell me, oh, I feel like I'm talking to a friend and we know that it's empathetic. Or I feel like this is too sad and we know that we need to bump up empathy and we're too difficult to understand. So we tested it and we were very successful in testing our content, our just written copy. And people with Down syndrome would say, you know, that was sad. It's talking about somebody dying and passing away and not being here anymore. But I felt like I was talking to a friend. And I know that for me to take the next step, I need to reach out to Vanguard. And this is how I would contact them. And this is how I know I would do it. So we knew that our content was working. So we created these two pages for beneficiaries and for executors. And these two pages are live right now on Vanguard.com. And they have been getting a lot of traffic and a lot of positive feedback from our folks who are visiting them. We also work with change of password. Now here's a team that sat down and their only task was to design change in password flow if you forget your password. Here's a team that sat down and came to me and said, we wonder how would somebody with Down syndrome go through a flow? And I said, okay, let's test it. So we found that people with Down syndrome didn't know what the word confirm meant in confirm password. So now we changed our entire copy to say enter password again. But also as a caveat to that, every single person with Down syndrome that I interviewed said, oh, Oksana, I don't forget my password. I remember my password. This is not a to me. So I said, okay, let's pretend that you forgot your password. Can you go through this flow? Does it make sense? So I thought that was interesting because they were like, no, I, don't, I remember my passwords and I remember my mom's passwords too. So something to think about. So what we're doing now is we're gathering industry research on how folks with disabilities manage their money and learn about investing. And I'm also gathering stuff, um, gathering um, information for researchers as a tool to say, this is how you work with somebody with a disability. So I, every time I do research, I gather a little bit more experience and I gather more information around that topic. We're partnering with the accessibility office to say, okay, we're compliant, but are these experiences usable for somebody with a disability? And we're performing rigorous research for with both panels. So our goal is to create a financial inclusion guide, kind of like Microsoft has an inclusive design guide. So a financial inclusion guide that will talk about how to create accessible experiences for people with disabilities. So thank you so much. Um, I can stop here and take any questions.